The Society of St. Pius X is being slammed for lack of transparency. In a Tuesday update to its Sex Abuse Review Board, the SSPX finally published a description of its review board members while failing to actually publish their names. Victims have requested full disclosure of identities to ensure no conflict of interest, but leadership has refused, unlike many dioceses that are transparent about their review board membership. Serving Catholics. A young man in Topeka, Kansas, Michael Gonzalez, a former student at the SSPX school in St. Mary's, Kansas, blew his brains out, unable to cope any longer with the effects of being raped by an SSPX priest. That priest is roaming, roaming about freely, even with privileged status, despite being named in young Michael's suicide note. In fact, story after story that Church Millicent has become familiar with over our three to four month spotlight investigation, the patterns repeat with frightening regularity. Abusive clergy, their abuse known for a certainty by leaders and administrators are simply moved around and sent right back to schools and chapels and seminaries with no one being able to question anything without being told they'd be committing a mortal sin. protesters and the answer to that is no they're terrorists Jewish Nazi and Tony is 
their own salvation has long been held by the Roman Catholic faith. Consequently, Jerusalem has long been coveted by the Vatican. In my book, Secret History, The Erased Clues That Prove Who Rules the World from Behind the Curtain, I share a fascinating account given by ex-Jesuit priest Alberto Rivera on Rome's manipulation of Islam in order to own Jerusalem. Rivera states that he was briefed directly by Cardinal Augustin Bay, the Jesuit provincial superior in Germany and the personal confessor to Eugenio Pacelli, Pope Pius XII, whom we've already told you was foundational in creating and guiding the Nazi Third Reich. Rivera says that Bay explained how Muhammad was tutored by his uncle, who was a Roman Catholic monk, who indoctrinated him to hate the Jews and to retake Jerusalem. Vatican officials thought it was particularly useful, not having a standing army of their own, to exploit Muslims in the Middle East to kill and be killed on behalf of their agenda. Between his Catholic wife, Khadija, and his Catholic mentor, Uncle Warakwa, it was easy to manipulate Muhammad. The Vatican did its best to enable Muslim armies to kill Jews and Christians in their mission to retake Jerusalem. But after they were successful, they shocked their masters by refusing to hand Jerusalem over to Rome. This was the real reason the Crusades were initiated. But Islam's rebellion was eventually put to good use. Rome would instead exploit the hatred that it had fomented between Muslims and Jews and resurrect the ancient nation-state known as Israel for two reasons. First, to be a place of never-ending war and conflict, and second, certainly most importantly, to wipe away the well-known understanding that Rome was the mystery Babylon mentioned in the book of Revelation, and the papacy was the office of the Antichrist. At the time of Martin Luther's Reformation in 1517, these were considered facts by sincere Christians. It is a testament to the success of the Roman and Freemasonic agenda in resurrecting Israel that now such understandings are unheard of. Today, Christians unknowingly believe Jesuit doctrines about the end times that will supposedly revolve around Jerusalem and Israel rather than Rome and the Vatican. As Napoleon Bonaparte moved through the Middle East in 1799, he fully intended to make this happen. A 2004 piece in Haaretz admitted, In the summer of 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte conquered Egypt, and in the summer of the same year, he led 30,000 soldiers through the Sinai Peninsula into the land of Israel. On March 7, 1799, Napoleon took control of Jaffa and then headed north to the besieged Acre. Napoleon intends, quote, to restore to the Jews their Jerusalem, end quote, read a French report at the time, while another report claimed that, quote, Bonaparte published a proclamation that calls on all the Jews of Africa and Asia to rally around his flag in order to reestablish ancient Jerusalem. Napoleon was a high Freemason, guided by the Jesuits through their agents like Emmanuel Joseph Sias, a Jesuit-trained Catholic priest and close confidant of the dictator. Although it did not occur in 1799, it remained a high priority for the Vatican and her Freemasonic foot soldiers, as was evidenced by a letter written 80 years later from Confederate Army General Albert Pike, a high Freemason 
and the founder of the Ku Klux Klan, the purpose of which was to exploit racial hatred to keep populations divided and easy to control. Two, high Italian Freemason Giuseppe Mazzini. The 1871 letter supposedly predicts the first two world wars and a third world war between Muslims and, quote, Zionists. Although Napoleon Bonaparte was unsuccessful in resurrecting the nation of Israel, he was able to help create the banking family that would eventually see it through. As a result of insider trading based upon Napoleon's loss at Waterloo, great wealth was handed to the family of Rothschild, named after the red shields the Romans used in battle. Does that sound like a stretch? It was further confirmed by the name of the family that was first incorporated, Meyer Amschel Rothschild and Son, a contorted acronym for Mars, the Roman god of war. As the Encyclopedia Judaica states, the Rothschilds are simply the keepers of the Vatican treasury. As we've already shown you, World War II, the Third Reich, and the Holocaust were all birthed by Rome and the Jesuits as an integral part of this agenda. The horrors of Adolf Hitler, a Vatican puppet created by the Jesuits, as was shown by the ghost writer of Mein Kampf, a Jesuit priest named Bernard Stampfel, along with henchmen and monsters like Heinrich Himmler, a Jesuit seminarian, Jews were forced to find a place where they would not be persecuted. When it appeared that there would not be a population large enough to reconstitute the nation-state of Israel, Jewish proselytes of dubious ancestry, such as the Khazars in southern Russia, were encouraged to join them. To this very day, duped Christians believe that it is important to donate money to help relocate Russian Jews to Israel. Sadly, many Jews are oblivious to this manipulation by the Vatican. One, however, was not. Canadian-born Israeli citizen and author Barry Shamish frequently wrote and spoke about Rome's manipulations in the Middle East. In January of 2001, Barry recounted how seven years previously, in 1994, the newspaper Shadashot revealed a most remarkable secret of the Middle East peace process. A friend of Shimon Peres, the French intellectual Marek Halter, claimed in an interview that in May of 93, he delivered a letter from Peres to the Pope. Within, Peres promised to internationalize Jerusalem, granting the United Nations political control of the old city, and the Vatican would be given hegemony over the holy sites within. Halter's claim was further backed by the Italian newspaper La Stampa, which added that Arafat was appraised of the agreement and was included in the secret clauses of the Declaration of Principles signed in Washington, D.C. in September of 1993. Barry continued, Perez's partner in crime and the real founder of the Oslo Accord, Yossi Bielin, coordinated his PLO policy with the Vatican. Bielin's deal with the Pope became another brief scandal when politicians like Agudat Yisrael head Avram Shapira and Jerusalem Deputy Mayor Shmuel Meir leaked hidden details of Bielin's Accord, which included, quote, the extraterritoriality of holy sites in Jerusalem, 
are going to be transferred to Vatican control, end quote. Later, Shapira was neutralized by having $250 million in debts accrued by his crooked carpet factory forgiven, while Mayer was permanently hushed when his car was crushed by a U.N. truck driver who was briefly questioned by Israeli police. In 2001, the foreign minister of Israel, Shlomo ben Ami, mysteriously shuttled between King Carlos of Spain and the Vatican. Shamish mentions that this is also a high priority for the Council on Foreign Relations. The real power of which, he states, is the Society of Jesus. Shamish, again, a Jewish-Israeli citizen, acknowledged that the Jesuits were a reaction to the Protestant Reformation, and their agenda was, quote, to return the planet to the good old days when one pope held monopoly on all world religions. Utilizing any evil means available, their plan is to eliminate all competition, be they Jew, Muslim, or Christian, who don't recognize the Vatican as their capital, end quote. Barry then added, it is their war on the Jews which will most interest my readers. It was the Jesuit control of Great Britain which was the real force behind Zionism and the reestablishment of a Jewish homeland in Israel. Just as Britain created Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Iraq, and Lebanon, Shemesh reinforced the understanding that the Holocaust was designed by the Jesuits to herd Jews towards Jerusalem. Barry cites Walter Schellenberg, chief of the Nazi Schickerheitsdienst, revealed how the SS was organized by Himmler according to the principles of the Jesuit order, the rules of service and spiritual exercises prescribed by Ignatius de Loyola constituted a model which Hitler strove carefully to copy. Zionist Israel is the creation of the Jesuit order. Its purpose is to secure Jerusalem for the Jesuits and their, quote, infallible Pope, that he may receive worldwide worship from Solomon's rebuilt temple. Masonic Zionists betrayed their own Jewish race into the hands of of Pope Pius XII and the concentration camps overseen by the Jesuit order. In 